Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started with just our housekeeping items. So welcome everyone. Good morning to this Workforce Wednesday webinar. My name is Kirsten Bayer and I'm with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University. I'm the Assistant Director of Communications there and I will be on for moderation and helping facilitate today's Workforce Wednesday webinar. We are excited to be joined by Norman Ruano from Illinois Works to talk about their pre-apprenticeship program, and today's uh, webinar is going to be focused on creating an equitable construction talent pipeline to show you um, in the system as a best practice for a pre-apprenticeship. So he'll be sharing um, best practices that you can replicate to um, potentially implement into your own pre-apprenticeship program. So we're excited to hear from him. A couple of housekeeping items. We are on the Zoom webinar platform today, not Zoom meeting. It is a little bit different if you're not familiar with the platform. While it looks like a regular Zoom meeting, you as an attendee do not have the ability to unmute yourself or to turn on your camera. So it is a little bit more of a presentation format as opposed to a meeting formatted platform. So for questions or comments, you can feel free to type those in the chat. Um, let me go ahead and make sure everyone can actually type in the chat because I always have to edit that in my settings. So yeah, the chat is open to everyone now. So you can feel free to say good morning to us. Um, you can participate in the chat for any questions or comments or concerns. You can also type questions in the Q&A um, option on your Zoom toolbar, or you can feel free when we pause for questions at the end to raise your Zoom hand, your virtual Zoom hand on the Zoom toolbar, and I have the ability to unmute you. So it's a little bit more of a controlled environment on the Zoom webinar platform. We also have closed captioning on today for accessibility reasons or for note-taking purposes, so feel free to use that. We are also recording today's webinar, so today's recording and the presentation slides will be available to you following today's webinar. It typically takes us about 48 working business hours to get the recording posted on our website, but it will be posted on the IllinoisWorkforceAcademy.com website, and it will also be posted on Illinois WorkNet, so you can find today's webinar on either one of those places. Tomorrow, you will receive a follow-up email that will have the URL where the uh, presentation and recording will be housed at. So you can access it through that follow-up email. And in that follow-up email, you will also have access to a follow-up survey. I sit on the WIOA Professional Development Committee that has um, representation from all co four core partners across the state. And we are who create and implement the professional development for this Workforce Wednesday webinar series. Um, and so we do look at the survey feedback. I personally look at it and compile it for the committee on a quarterly basis. And um, so if you take that follow-up survey, we do look at your feedback on today's session. And then there's also a question on there where you can suggest any future professional development topics that you would like to see or that you feel like you need within the system. So we do welcome that feedback. I'm also going to put that same follow-up survey in the chat towards the end of the session if you would like to take it um, in a timely fashion following today's webinar. Um, I believe that's all the housekeeping items that I have. I'm also going to do just a couple of analytical polls that we like to have for the WIO Professional Development Committee. So I just launched the first one. The first one is just where's your local area at today. We want to make sure we're hitting um, all across the state because Workforce Wednesday webinars are directed as professional development for all four core partners, as well as LWIAs, frontline staff, CBOs, employers. Um, we have multiple stakeholders that we're trying to hit, so we want to make sure um, that we're reaching across the state in your local areas. So if everyone could go ahead and take that poll for me, we'll give it a couple more seconds. Couple more people. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end that and share the results. Looks like we have a lot of people from Central Illinois on today, which is awesome. And a couple in Chicago and Southern Illinois as well. So thank you for taking that poll. And then the next poll is just which partner do you best represent? So if you best represent title one, two, three, or four, or if you're other we have a partner or stakeholder or a part of our state or local workforce innovation board, have you go ahead and answer that. We're expecting a lot of Title I on today, obviously due to the topic, but we have a couple Title II people as well, which is awesome. And even a Title IV person, great. We'll give a couple more seconds. Okay. 
Okay, like I said, mostly Title I on with us today, but a couple of Title II and Four as well. So thank you for joining us and spending your morning with us. We appreciate it. We hope you find this professional development session really valuable. Um, and if anyone needs anything, you can feel free to reach out to me directly via the chat. Uh, and Norman, I'm going to hand it off to you to get your presentation started. Uh, thank you very much, Kirsten, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I, um, I'm very glad to uh, share some time with uh, some colleagues. A little bit of background about me. I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Illinois Works now, but I have spent over 25 years doing workforce development on the ground. I'm not the typical um, you know, bureaucrat uh, that runs these programs. I'm actually a practitioner that was recruited to come and implement these programs at the Office of Illinois Works at DCEO. So from my perspective, the implementation of these programs and their success have to come from a practitioner's perspective. And that's what we have done with these programs. So I just wanted to share that with you. I, I appreciate the work that uh, workforce development professionals do throughout the state of Illinois. I did that work for many, many, many years and uh, glad to be here today. Anna, if we can move on to the next slide, please. I also wanna mention that with me today is Dr. Anna Bedar from our PD professional development team at NIU who's been supporting uh, this effort and all of our professional development efforts. Anna, if you could please say hi to our audience today. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. And also with me today is uh, uh, Monica Pruitt, one of our project managers. She's here in case there are questions I'm not able to answer. Uh, Monica, if you want to please say hi to our to our audience today. Glad to. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Monica. So the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity is uh, the, the state agency that houses the Office of Illinois Works. And the Office of Illinois Works is a new bureau that was created, uh, particularly after the passing of the Illinois Works Jobs Program Act. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But this uh, uh, office in this program uh, model uh, has several programs we're gonna be discussing today. They're all uh, innovative in how the model works and innovative and in how they're implemented. So we'll discuss those in a minute. The focus of our presentation today is to develop a clear understanding of Illinois Works, uh, how it came about, its potential on skilled labor in the state, uh, understanding how the model itself and the programs and services that are implemented uh, are a result of the Illinois Wars Jobs Program Act and how those were, how those are being structured and delivered, and also to learn best practices that we hope can be useful to other workforce development professionals, particularly focused on performance-based grants, program standards, very strong and robust professional development, career services, robust reporting and real-time reporting, longitudinal evaluations, and continuous improvement. So we'll spend the majority of our time talking about that. However, uh, Anna, we can move on to the next uh, slide. Um, the first part of the presentation will be on Illinois Works, how the model is innovative in itself, how, how the programs work together, uh, what are those programs and services that are offered through that model, all again uh, within the context of the Illinois Works Jobs Program Act. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity is the state agency where the Office of Illinois Works, which is one of the bureaus, there's one of the newest bureaus at the office sits. And that bureau, uh, which is the one that I oversee, is the one implementing all of the Illinois Works programs. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. So, uh, you know, history here uh, quickly. How, how does this come about? This was created as a result of the $45 billion capital plan. So Illinois Works is attached to the construction side, obviously, of the industry. Illinois Works exclusively focuses on supporting the construction industry, the trades, and ensuring that, uh, more importantly, uh, that it is accessible, that industry and those trades are accessible to underrepresented populations. It's very important to keep in mind that in the state of Illinois, those trades, particularly the best paid trades, have not been accessible for diverse communities. The, our target population is underrepresented populations as defined by Illinois Works, is women, minorities, and veterans. Um, here is something very important. Fewer than 10% of the best paid apprentices 
have been extended to women and minorities in the state of Illinois uh, as we speak uh, before obviously Illinois Wars came about. Uh, so this act, the Illinois Wars Jobs Program Act, which was passed in 2019, was specifically designed and intentionally designed to increase equity and opportunity in construction. And the second key item about this is we are focused on creating a qualified and sustainable talent pipeline within construction and the trades. Not only is it about equity, equity being one of the key items for us, but it's also about talent pipeline sustainability because there are huge investments being made, $45 billion by the state. I know there are $15, $20 billion the feds are pumping into the Illinois economy as a result of the infrastructure bill. There's more money coming in for, for broadband, more money coming in for um, climate related uh, investments. And obviously there's a concern about the sustainability of the talent pipeline. So that's the origin of Illinois Works. Moving on, Anna. Uh, what's the economic impact? So we know the construction industry, it's supposed to grow from four to 6% for the next five years. We probably have all seen those numbers. We also know that this sector pays an average $18 an hour for apprentices. Uh, once they reach journey person status, it's an average of 32. That's an average. I can tell you that, you know, uh, journey uh, people in electricity, um, plumbing, in, in operators, they're making $75, $80 an hour, right? So, I mean, these are well-paid, um, well-compensated uh, careers that also have a whole benefit package attached to them. They still provide pensions, you know, obviously health, life insurance and all of that. So these are definitely not only well-paid, um, you know, careers, but they are careers that provide all the support needed for a high quality job. We also know that investing in job training provides significant long-term economic impact to the state in the range of $1.2 billion. We know for a fact that for every dollar invested in construction job training, Illinois obtains $11 in social and economic returns. So we know it's a great investment. We know the sector is gonna grow well. So this is definitely an area that we're very, very interested in strategically supporting and that's what Illinois Works does. Moving on. Anna. So how do we do it? What's the innovation behind this workforce development model? So here is where, we really make uh, huge differences. And this again is credit to the governor's office, the legislators and all the people that were involved in designing this model and then passing it. In order to increase equity and to have a sustainable and qualified talent pipeline, uh, this is the model that we're using. There are three programs that have been implemented. The apprenticeship initiative is a very important program. It's one of the components that workforce development models typically don't have, and this is a demand component. Through the apprenticeship initiative, and I'll explain a little bit more, we create demand in construction, okay? So job opportunities are being created through this Illinois Works program in order for those opportunities to then be filled by the pre-apprenticeship program. The pre-apprenticeship program is a talent pipeline program, uh, 37 providers right now as we speak throughout the state of Illinois with capacity to train 1,800 people. We are bringing its maximum capacity this summer through another NOFL to 2,000 residents being trained throughout the state of Illinois, about 40 to 45 programs, an investment of 20 to $25 million a year in the pre-apprenticeship program. So the apprenticeship initiative is a demand component. The pre-apprenticeship uh, program is a talent pipeline component to fill that demand. And the bid credit program, which is actually a bank, uh, it's a big credit bank. It's an incentive program for contractors. The higher and retain our graduates, they can earn bid credits in their bank accounts and they use those bid credits to bid future state funded projects so that they can win those projects. So the three components of the model in terms of programs are, you know, a demand component, a talent pipeline component and an incentive system, all very generous, all very well funded, all working together to move the gears of this engine called the construction industry and the trades. The other supportive service that we have is career services. So, you know, one of the key things is when we put uh, programming out there, we want to make sure that it's not bureaucratic. We want to make sure 
that contractors and employees can navigate it. Our career services team was designed for contractors to request graduates in particular areas of the, of the state with particular skill sets. And our career services team will then provide and identify those graduates and match them to those contractors so that those graduates can be hired. Uh, also, DOL registered apprenticeship programs, the unions can request list of graduates in particular areas of the state because they need individuals to go into their apprenticeship programs. Our career services will interface with them and do that. Career services also looks for job opportunities, like a job development uh, function also, looking for projects around the state, you know, the um, the renovation of O'Hare, the expansion of O'Hare, or any of those projects out there that may have job opportunities for our graduates so that we can then match our graduates to those opportunities. So this is the model that we use. And as you can see, with all of these components and all of these pieces working together, then we expect for the gears of construction to start moving in the right direction uh, to ensure that there's equity and sustainability in the construction industry and the trades for years to come. Um, moving on to the next slide. Let's start talking about each of these programs uh, quickly and then I'll get to the best practices that we're using, particularly in relation to the pre-apprenticeship program. So the demand component is called the apprenticeship initiative. Uh, and this uh, focuses on ensuring that all projects that are state funded that are at least $500,000 or more um, have apprentices working in them, okay? At least 10% of the hours for each of the trades in a project, electricity, carpentry, labor, all of the trades uh, have to be done by apprentices and at least half of those 10%, in other words, 5% of the labor hours have to be done by Illinois Works graduates, uh, Climate Works graduates, or IDAT graduates. They could be graduates of one of those three programs. Not only are we creating demand in construction through this program, but we are also requiring that they hire our graduates. Uh, what's important also about this one, going back, Anna, to the previous slide, is that if contractors don't comply with these requirements, there are consequences for them. They can be fined. Uh, they can be put on a stop payment list. Uh, they can be um, um, they can be blocked from doing business with the state. There are different consequences that can be applied to non-compliant contractors. We have a whole team at DCEO at the Office of Illinois Works under the Apprenticeship Initiative that watches the compliance of those projects. And as we speak right now, we're watching the compliance of over 600 construction projects being paid for by the state throughout the state of Illinois. Uh, worth about $8 billion. And we typically watch the compliance of about 12 to $15 billion worth of construction projects throughout the state of Illinois. So that's the demand component. It is very important to keep in mind that this is innovative. It typically does not, is not included in a workforce development model. I don't know if there are any questions in the chat, uh, uh, Kirsten or Anna in the chat that uh, related to what I have discussed so far. Nope, there's no questions as of right now. Great, thank you very much. Moving on to the next component. This is the component where we're gonna spend a lot of time today later talking about best practices. But in general, what this does is that it's a, a skills training program. So we focus and target underrepresented populations throughout the state of Illinois and all regions of the state, women, minorities, and veterans interested in entering the construction industry. It's not exclusive. To those populations, that's our target. Anybody can participate. We focus a lot on providing transition services because the ultimate goal is for those individuals to enter the construction industry, make a career in construction and enter the DOL registered apprenticeship program. Uh, the other thing that is very important is that the wraparound services provided are very robust and that includes free tuition uh, and stipends. They get very robust stipends, uh, right? I think right now we're at $14 a training hour. So they could, for participating in this program, they could get anywhere between $2,000 to $3,000 as a stipend. It's all performance-based stipends. In other words, they have to perform, they have to do well in attendance and do well in their academic performance, but there's a very robust stipend and wraparound system included there. 
This is paid by a uh, $25 million appropriation that Illinois Works has through Rebuild Illinois. Because of that, it has sustainability through time. Uh, we expect to invest a significant amount of money in the next 10 to 20 years through this program. It, it makes this program the first financially sustainable construction pre-apprenticeship program funded by the state of Illinois. There have been other programs in the past that are funded uh, periodically or once in a while through various initiatives, but this is a dedicated funding mechanism uh, that has sustainability through years to come through its own appropriation. But again, we'll discuss more some of the best practices we're using with this program. So that's that was the that's the talent pipeline creation program, the pre-apprenticeship program delivered through community-based organizations. And as I said, we have 37 of them right now. Uh, moving on to the third program, uh, uh, the bid credit program, as I mentioned, it provides incentives for to hire and retain a diverse pool of candidates. Contractors and subcontractors can earn bid credits by hiring our graduates and employing them as apprentices. Uh, our graduates will carry graduate cards that indicate they're a graduate of Illinois Works. It has their graduate number so that contractors can claim bid credits on those individuals. And if we verify that those individuals actually work for them uh, and they're graduates of our program, then those bid credits are deposited in the contractor's bank account. They, they actually have a bank account and it works just like a bank. And then they can use those bid credits to bid future projects. Um, and just by bidding with bid credits, they can actually win projects that otherwise they wouldn't have won. So that's another one of those innovative components. This program is operational. We're in final stages of rule approval to finalize a couple of details for the program, but it's definitely operational. There's a team of professionals at Illinois Works in charge of this program. Moving on to the last, to the next one. Um, so career services is what we call the glue that keeps the system together. And that is career services is the one that follows up with our graduates, finds out what they are, are they available for work? What their career plans are? Are they progressing uh, through their apprenticeship programs? Are they employed? Are they not? Uh, where are they located in the state of Illinois? Uh, also, we develop relationships with the DOL registered apprenticeship programs. And more importantly, we provide job matching for graduates with contractors. So contractors will submit a job order to us through our, our ATS system. Uh, we will receive that job order and then work with our local grantees and also the, the graduates to put together a list of available individuals to match that job. We will then send the, the resumes to the contractors after all of those individuals have been vetted and contractors can then reach out to our, our graduates and hire them. We are also providing lists of graduates, customized list of graduates for apprenticeship programs, for unions, for trade associations, for contractors, if they're looking for a list of graduates to follow up with in order to comply with Illinois Works, in order to earn bid credits, or just because they need talent to fill certain positions throughout the state of Illinois. So this is a very strategic part of the Illinois Works model. And again, these three programs with this support service work together to bring about equity and sustainability to the construction workforce. Um, any questions in the in the chat so far? Uh, no. I don't... Yeah. Okay. No, there are no questions in the chat. Okay, great. So, what are the goals? What are the strategic goals of Illinois Works and all of its programs? We want to provide a career pathway for residents and disadvantaged communities. Obviously, we're talking about career pathways here. We don't want just a job, we want a career. That is the reason why we focus so much on transitioning individuals to DOL registered apprenticeship programs because we know how those pay progressively and how they can get uh, not only a well-paid job, but also the benefits uh, that are offered. We also want to provide eligible apprentices with the skills for lifelong job security. You know, uh, we have heard the big debates about college versus straight school, college versus other training programs. Obviously, we believe that there are individuals that are truly interested in pursuing other opportunities above and beyond college. And, and we wanna make sure that they have the skills for lifelong job security. 
We also want to promote construction as a viable job industry for women and minority communities because a lot of those communities have not had access to construction jobs in the past. A lot of times construction is not seen as a viable industry. We want to continue to promote uh, construction in the trade as a viable industry for those communities. Uh, at the same time, we want to provide the construction industry and the trades with consistent skilled workforce for generations to come. This goes again to the sustainability of the talent pipeline through time, given the retirement waves we're seeing and all the projects that are coming in the pipeline. And at the same time, we want to continue to develop new partnerships between state, in this case, DCO and Illinois Works and community organizations. And we'll talk in a minute on how we do that uh, because we follow a very particular model at DCEO. Moving on to uh, the next slide, Anna. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about our innovative practices, but particularly focused on the pre-apprenticeship program. We'll discuss uh, our performance-based uh, grant model we're gonna talk about program standards. We're gonna talk about the robust professional development system we have, we, the robust reporting system we have, our longitudinal evaluation and design, and, and also our continuous uh, development or continuous program improvement philosophy and model. So uh, moving on to the, the first one, let's talk about performance-based payment model. So one of the key things we wanna do, next slide, Anna, if you don't, if you don't mind, we wanted to do as we were putting together these programs is to ensure that whatever we did uh, should be based on an organization's tangible impact in the community. We have no interest in wasting $20, 25000000 million a year. Uh, and we have no interest in, in, in wasting people's dreams and time. So as a result, we wanted to put together a model that could get us uh, to where we wanted, and that is impact, true impact in, in the lives of people, people's careers and in their communities. Um, so our focus is to produce real change in Illinois. Uh, so as a result, we instituted this model, which is a performance-based model. But as you know, in the state of Illinois, all grants operate under GATA, which requires that all grants also have to be a reimbursement model. So as a result, um, the, the, it's, it's a mixture of performance-based with reimbursement. So metrics dictate the amount available for reimbursement, but grantees must still submit allowable expenses to access that funding. So that's how the model ends up playing out. Let's go to the next slide where we talk about some of the key benefits of our model, and then I'll show a formula so that it's easier to understand what we're doing here. Some of the key aspects of our performance-based model is that if a grantee is a very good performer, they meet and exceed metrics, they can actually earn funding beyond their initial grant award. So I'll give you an example. Most of our grantees get about $550,000 to operate their programs on an annual basis. If they are very good at what they do, and we have some grantees that are very good at what they do, they could actually end up with $600,000 that they can use for a given year because their metrics, their performance is exceeding the metrics that were set up in their contract. So that's how this model works. We don't limit you. If you are very good, you overall, you overperform, you could definitely earn more money than the original grant amount. At the same time, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but we have a real-time live reporting mechanism platform called the Illinois Works Reporting System, grantees are required to report to us daily the activities of their programs. And because of that, we have access to that data and we can release payments to them on a monthly basis. They don't have to wait uh, every quarter to submit their PFRs and get paid. They can actually submit the PFRs on a monthly basis and get paid for their performance on a monthly basis. And the third uh, key component of our model is that uh, they have the right to appeal if a grantee believes that they missed a particular outcome metric uh, because there is a variable outside of their control. And I'll give you an example. Just yesterday, we got an appeal from one of our grantees. They had uh, two women in their program. This is a program that serves mainly women in the city of Chicago. And they, um, 
they uh while those those two ladies were in their program they applied to DOL registered apprenticeship programs and they got accepted the one got accepted to the plumbers the other one got accepted to the electricians so they didn't complete the program and one of the metrics for us is that they have to complete the program for the grantee to get paid so they submit a, an appeal to us. We have an appeal form. They submit it to their grant manager. And it says, we're appealing completion on these individuals because they already got accepted to a DOL registered apprenticeship program. Can we please get paid for completion even though they didn't complete the program because they already made it to a DOL registered apprenticeship program? We would then look at their argument, verify they have to provide evidence that that's the case. And very likely we're going to grant that appeal because our ultimate goal is for them to go to a DOL registered apprenticeship program. And if they already got there, even though they didn't complete the program, we would grant them uh, completion and appeal. So anyways, that's another key feature of our program. Moving on to the, to the next uh, slide, Anna. Okay, so these are the metrics that we pay our grantees on. We pay them a certain dollar amount for enrollment, a certain dollar amount for completions, a certain dollar amount for transitions, and then we also pay them a certain dollar amount for closeout reports, meaning we verify all their data at the end of the year to make sure that whatever they're claiming they've done is correct and there's evidence to show that that's the case. Uh, this right here follows what we call our pre-apprentice life cycle. They enroll, they complete, they transition, and then we do the verification to make sure all is well, and then we go, they go on to do a career in construction and we move on to other individuals. Here's the regular formula that we use for paying uh, grantees. So enrollment is 25%. We will allocate 25% the, of their grant money towards enrollment metrics. We would allocate 30% uh, towards completion metrics, 35% towards transition metrics, and 10% for closeout reports. And that gives you 100%. So you will notice that it goes from 25 to 35. And that is for us, the enrollment metric is important, but the one that is the most important is the transition metric. And that's the reason why we allocate more funding towards that. Just an idea how much money that is. Typically we pay anywhere between 2,500 to $3,000 for an enrollment. We pay a little bit over $3,500 for a completion and about $5,000 for a transition. Uh, and then 10%, obviously grantees may be getting about $55,000 once we are able to do closeout every year for their grant and, and they have their, and their data is in good shape in our system. That's how that works. We also have, and soon you will find out about our professional development system. We have a program called the Accelerator Track 3. Accelerator programs are for very small organizations, typically organizations in parts of the state where we don't have workforce infrastructure. You know, um, we typically talk in the United States about food deserts, uh, and that is a very unfortunate situation we have in our country. But we also talk at, uh, at Illinois Works about workforce deserts. And these are places throughout the state of Illinois where there is not a lot of workforce infrastructure to be able to train, prepare people for jobs in their communities and in the sectors in those areas. And as a result, our accelerator program is focused on bringing in smaller organizations that don't have a lot of capacity, that don't have a lot of experience and that need a lot of help. We have a special formula for them uh, to provide funding, particularly focused on ensuring that they get a significant capital advance so that they can set up their program. And then they also get other components that I'm gonna discuss as part of our uh, professional development um, um, conversation. So those are the formulas that we use all based on outcome metrics and ensuring that there is impact in the community. Moving on, Anna. Any questions before I talk about program standards? None in the chat. Great, thank you. Program standards, so for us, uh, we wanna make sure that quality programming, quality workforce development is really what we're doing out there. We are not interested in, you know, in just, you know, going through the dynamics, wasting money and also wasting people's time. As a result, we have very strict standards on curriculum. We have strict standards on instructors. We have strict standards on staffing. And we all have strict standards on student support services, wraparound services and transition services. 
all of these standards are published and documented through our guidance, through our grantee manual. Every January, we put together a grantee manual and uh, we publish a grantee manual. Right now it's a 200 page grantee manual with all kinds of tools. It has all the guidance, it has all the requirements. It integrates with our technology. And this is what grantees receive when they start onboarding in January. We do a comprehensive onboarding process for them. If you're a new grantee with Illinois Works, you're gonna be taking 10 uh, webinars and face-to-face and -face events in the first two. Uh, months of the year, just onboarding and learning all of our guidance, our technology to ensure that then you can implement your program. So for us, program standards are fundamental just to make sure that there is quality in the programming that we do. Uh, and then we'll talk in a minute on how we check against those standards to see if you are executing or not based on those standards. But those are key. This is a key important requirement of Illinois Works and how it's operated. Professional development. So our professional development philosophy, remember I just mentioned that we have workforce deserts that we have encountered throughout the state of Illinois. And our focus is ensuring that our grantees can successfully implement an Illinois Works Pre Apprenticeship Program, that they can comply with our policies, and more importantly, that they can use the technological tools that we have created for them. We really want to develop the workforce providers infrastructure throughout the state and give them capacity so that they can deliver what I just mentioned a minute earlier, high quality services, not only in Chicago, not only in the metro area, but throughout the whole state of Illinois. And that's the focus of our professional development uh, program. Uh, this is a program that we deliver in partnership with Northern Illinois University, and we have a whole professional development team. Moving on, Anna, to the next slide. Brian. So our professional development uh, system includes a variety of components. Uh, there is in-person events. We, we run a regional meeting uh, in, in spring. We run an annual conference in the fall, bring in all, their grant, all the grantees and their staff uh, to leverage each other's knowledge and experience resources to network, bring in professionals and experts from other places. We also have those individuals in our program share the best practices that they use in their programs. We also have a lot of listening sessions in those events to get feedback on our technology, our systems, our guidance. All of that is done in person in two different events uh, that we run in the year. We also do webinar sessions. The webinar sessions we do include the onboarding that I just mentioned, but we also do a monthly webinar on various topics related to Illinois Works, related to best practices and pre-apprenticeship programming or the construction industry. Uh, these are all required events. Uh, I will mention, for instance, Toolbox Tuesday, which is a lunch and learn series that we do the first week of every month. It's a one hour uh, webinar, typically just focus on skills development, very particular topics, women in construction or minorities in construction, some of those topics. And it's that's not a requirement, but it's open to all staff members at our grantees. Uh, we also do a very, very uh, robust uh, program coaching system. And I'll explain in a minute but basically what we do is that we conduct a needs analysis and based on, on what track you're put on, you may be required uh, to do coaching up to 10 hours a month. Or if you're in an accelerated program, which it's another one of our interventions, you're required to do 20 hours a month of coaching with our professional coaches. Uh, we also do technical assistance. This is delivered by our grant managers whenever we conduct compliance reporting and we find out that there are gaps in your performance, things that need to be addressed, or if you have questions and you're looking for technical assistance, you can schedule technical assistance sessions one-on-one -on -one with our grant managers and they will deliver that. We do tons and do tons of those on a, in a given month and, and obviously for the given program year. And the last thing that we also do is communities of practice. Uh, we have three communities of practice, one for wraparound services, one for transition services, and one for instructors. And these focus on sharing resources and ensuring that uh, they're leveraging each other's knowledge and experience 
uh, so and they network with each other so that we can continue to develop the knowledge base of our providers. So this is our professional development uh, and technical assistance model, very robust. We invest a lot of resources and time executing this because ultimately we want to develop the workforce infrastructure throughout the whole state of Illinois and ensure that there's quality workforce development service being offered throughout the whole state. Moving on to the next slide, Anna. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on the track. So we conduct an in-depth needs analysis of all grantees at the end of uh, the year to help us determine what track a grantee will go on the next year. And there are three tracks they can go into. Track one, and traditionally uh, grantees that are more developed, have more experience, have been doing this for a while. They will be provided with a uh, you know, required um, professional development activities, but also uh, they're not required to do coaching. They, we do provide a professional development plan uh, for them so that they can do other training outside of Illinois Works to continuously develop their staff. If the grantee is a track two or a track, uh, track three organization, we do provide a coaching plan for them and they are required and what is not of each of the tracks. So as you can see here, if you're a track one organization, you are required to engage in all of those activities that have uh, the check mark. And then also we provide a professional development plan uh, for you to internally continuously develop your staff. If you're a track, if they're a track two, then they have to do all of the same stuff. Plus they have to do up to 10 hours of coaching per month delivered by our uh, professional coaches uh, through our uh, professional development team. And then if you're a track, if they're a track three grantee or an accelerator program, those are the small organizations that I mentioned that we really want to develop and they need a lot of, a lot of intensity they get more professional development, including an added component of coaching. They have to do 10 to 20 hours per month. They also uh, join support groups and peer mentoring. And this is all focused on ensuring that they can graduate out of track three into track two. Ultimately, we want all of our grantees operating in track one, because that's where the most efficiency is and the, the, the best quality of services. So that is how the tr tracks operate. Yes, any questions? None that I see in the chat. Okay, great. So the program coaching is delivered by professional coaches. We have uh, four coaches in our, in our system. They are assigned certain grantees that they work with. They use a coaching plan to deliver the coaching. They meet with them on a weekly basis for a certain number of hours. And the goal is to strategically develop their capacity Coaching is more strategic, it's more proactive, it's not reactive. Our um, right, grant managers are the ones that deal with the reactive items that come as a result of their compliance. But coaching is more strategic. It's a whole year engagement. And then we will evaluate at the end of the year how we did in the coaching. Did they close gaps? Did they close needs they had? And are they now able to graduate from one track to another? based on the needs analysis we conduct. So it's a very structured approach. Uh, it is a requirement as part of their agreement and they have to execute it. And we do coaching briefings every two weeks to find out how we're progressing and issues we're facing out there related to coaching of grantees. Uh, next slide, Anna. So I mentioned earlier, we have those communities of practice for three, three different communities of practice. This is a new component within our professional development model, but we truly believe that there is, it's very important to focus on certain groups of professionals uh, at the grantee staff, uh, wraparound services, transition services staff, you know, instructors, so that they can be developed and receive uh, specialized resources and, and develop relationships among each other uh, to be able to continuously improve on the quality of the services that they provide. Next item, Anna. The webinar sessions, as I mentioned, there is a very large number of webinars that we offer both as onboarding sessions and also throughout the year. A lot of them are technology-based. We actually do hands-on technology training with them, teaching them how to use our training platform, our, our reporting platform, 
IWRS, but also just in general best practices. Uh, as part of our onboarding, we do a whole series on, the, on our grantee manual and the guidance containing it and the different forms and documents that must be used. All of those webinars are, are recorded and they're saved in our partner guide where our grantees can go and, and listen to webinars and, and, and look at the, uh, the resources, slide decks or whatever we produce for those webinars. Next one, Anna. Toolbox Tuesday, as I mentioned, it's a, you know, a monthly uh, session, you know, one hour every month uh, where we cover very specialized topics uh, related to different needs that are identified. Um, these are very interactive and we have a lot of staff from different grantees throughout the state join these uh, first, first Tuesday of the month. Okay, so that's our professional development model. As I mentioned, we spent a lot of resources, time and effort in developing the uh, capabilities of our grantees and ensuring that they can uh, provide quality services. The next best, best practice has to do with robust reporting. Uh, one of the key things about uh, pre-apprenticeship programs that, were, that I knew about, because I, I had, um, um, I had delivered a pre-apprenticeship programming in my, my career, but I also heard about from USDOL, even the White House called me and discussed this uh, with me was they were very concerned that pre-apprenticeship programs did not have a robust reporting system. And they wanted to make sure as we were implementing Illinois Works that that was not going to be the case with Illinois Works. And I can tell you that that is not the case with Illinois Works. Illinois Works has a very robust reporting system uh, grantees are required to use the Illinois Works reporting system uh, on a daily basis and re report their activities. They have to report attendance for participants. They have to report academic performance. They have to report wraparound services that are being provided, stipends that are being paid out when they're being paid out. They have to report all of the transition services that are being provided via resume writing or uh, you know, interview prep or applications to DOL register apprenticeship programs. They have to upload documents, rosters into the, into the system, uh, high school diplomas or uh, the certifications the participants receive. All of that has to be documented in Illinois Works. And not only is it reported in Illinois Works, we don't use claim data, we actually use verified data on a monthly basis, we run a compliance reporting system and we go and verify all of that data that they submitted up to the end of the previous month. And then we issue a report. We issue a monthly compliance report to grantees and we'll show in a minute how that report shows. But what we're basically doing is ensuring that all of this tracking that they're doing uh, by the way, we partner uh, with uh, Southern Illinois University's Center for Workforce Development uh, for IWRS. They're the ones that develop it, troubleshoot it, uh, and provide support for us. But what we ensure is that the grantees are passing through the pre-apprentice life cycle. This is our life cycle here. And then we're verifying all of that information in IWRS. The next, uh, next slide, Anna. Once we verify the information, grantees receive this report that you have on your screen. That is the monthly compliance review and report, and they're giving a certain compliance rating. So let's say their compliance is 75%. 75% compliance rating means that they're in good standing with us. If their uh, compliance rating is 60%, they're in inadequate standing. Uh, if they're below 50%, they're in poor standing with Illinois Works. And if they're in adequate standing or poor standing, they can be put on probation. They can be put on a watch list. They can be put on a corrective action plan to correct whatever we're seeing out there. Through this report, not only do we tell them how they're performing, we also tell them how much they're earning as a result of their performance. This report is sent to the grantee on a monthly basis. Uh, Attached, we, we send a spreadsheet where we verify all their data and tell them what the issues are with their data, anything they have to do to correct data. So the next month when we pull compliance, uh, if those things are verified and corrected, we can then release funding for them related to those, to those metrics. This is then sent to our Office of Grant Management, which is the one that executes payments uh, to grantees. And as long as they have submitted uh, verifiable expenses that are allowable, 
they can get paid based on whatever they generated through their performance. So again, this happens on a monthly basis throughout the program year. Moving on to the next one. So that's our robust reporting. Daily, we verify it and they have to correct it. And then when we do a close out at the end of the year, starting in December, we start going through all their data and then anything that has not been corrected by then needs to be corrected in order for them to get paid their closeout money that is attached to the formula. Uh, we are uh, finishing, there's a couple of guarantees we still are finishing when it comes to closeout, but our average closeout in terms of accuracy and correctness of data for last year is about 98, 98.5%, meaning out of not, out of 100% of the data that was centered in IWRS, we were able to verify and confirm 98.5% of the data. Um, continuous program improvement is the, the next uh, practice that we follow in this program. Um, it's very, very important for us that grantees and ourselves follow our continuous program improvement model. Our focus is on ensuring that Illinois Works is one of the best program models that exists throughout the whole country. In fact, just this year, USDOL and USDOT uh, already included Illinois Works as, as part of their best practices um, uh, the, that they're promoting in the country for executing these types of programs. Our focus with the continuous program improvement model is that we want to identify incremental and innovative enhancements, okay? And we want to make sure that not only do we identify them, but that those are implemented as part of their delivery processes. So as a result, each grantee is required to implement a continuous program improvement process uh, that includes leveraging the data that they have available through Illinois Works, through our compliance reporting, and then create an annual program improvement plan that they have to submit to us so that we can see what it is that they're focusing on in terms of improvement and ensure that we're following through on that, okay? Now, that's when it comes to our grantees internally. If we can move on to the next slide, Anna. Internally, we do the same. This is our model here for uh, 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 improvement. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, internally, we are also implementing the same because we want to. We want the Office of Illinois Works in our processes and our systems to continuously improve the technology, to continuously improve. I can't tell you, we spend a lot of money in improving technology, improving guidance. Um, there's an annual uh, program improvement plan that gets put for each of these programs. We also have feedback and listening sessions we conduct through our, our events and also through the evaluation to collect data from grantees. We meet with grantees to encourage them to help us understand where their recommendations are for improvement so that we can improve ourselves, our team, our policies, our procedures, our technology. So it's not only grantees that have to improve, but also ourselves internally. Next slide, Anna. Final uh, best practice that, that we follow is the longitudinal evaluation. So for us, it, it, because we're looking for outcomes and we're looking for long-term impacts on the lives of people, their careers, their families and their communities, we need to be able to track that and we need to be able to verify that. So the NIU Center for Governmental Studies has contracted to perform this evaluation, looking up to 10 years after an individual engaged with us to see where they are, to see how, how they were impacted in their trajectory. And in order to do that, next slide, please. Uh, they, they have a variety of tools, right? Um, you know, they're looking at implementation studies. How was this implemented? Is this working? Uh, how does it compare against goals, the locations, the time that is being invested? Next one, Anna. Outcome studies. They're also looking at, did they graduate? Did they have a job? Did they go into a trade? Did they complete the trade? Did they drop out? How much money are they making now versus before they were in the program? Did they actually achieve a you know a career um, for women, for minorities, for veterans? Is it different than other programs? Is it the same? Is Illinois Works having an impact? Are local programs having an impact? Right. Next one, Anna. So as a result, we are fully committed to not only 
you know, having goals and programs and the investment, but we're fully committed to verifying the impact of those programs and those investments in the lives of people, the communities and the state in general, and also looking at how that's impacting the construction industry. Do we have more women working in construction? Do we have more minorities working in construction? Do we have more veterans? You know, is this having an impact after five years, after 10 years? So that's the whole thing behind it. And it, it helps also that I happen to be a sociologist by training and I love the stats and I really want to make sure that we're doing something that matters, not only going through the dynamics. Uh, so that's the presentation today. I don't know if there are any questions. There were no questions that were asked while the presentation was going on. I don't know at this particular moment, anybody has any questions about what we're doing, how we're doing and how is how this is different than other initiatives, but I would love, we have about five minutes, I guess, to entertain questions if anybody has any questions. Yeah, so there's no questions in the chat as of right now, but if anybody has any, feel free to post them in the chat or the Q&A. And you can also raise your Zoom hand on your Zoom toolbar, and I'd be happy to unmute you if you'd like to have a dialogue with Norman. And while we're waiting for people to type their questions, um, I'll do my final housekeeping items. So this webinar was recorded and the recording from today will be posted on our Illinois Workforce Academy website as well as Illinois WorkNet. And then uh, we do have a follow-up survey. The follow-up in your follow-up email tomorrow, you will have the URL where the recording and presentation slides will be posted but you will also have this follow-up survey and I'm gonna go ahead and put that link to the follow-up survey in the chat now. If you would like to go ahead and take it, you can feel free to do so. I know for me, I'm not gonna take a follow-up survey unless it's right after a webinar. So um, I went ahead and posted that in the chat for everyone. And then if, again, if anyone has any questions or comments, feel free to type those in the chat or raise your Zoom hand. I don't see any questions, right, Dr. Kirsten, in the, in the chat, or there are no questions, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss with our colleagues uh, what we're doing at Illinois Works. We certainly will make sure that you uh, get the slide deck and you can share it with, uh, with the audience. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure to uh, be able to discuss workforce development. One important thing to keep in mind is that Illinois Works is known nationally, and I'm part of a couple of national task forces discussing workforce development issues. And Illinois, Illinois is definitely known for innovative practices and in, uh, in ensuring that we are doing, um, you know, just being on the, on the cutting edge of what's going on with workforce development. I was recently in a panel with the US Secretary of Labor and she herself said, you know, that she appreciates what Illinois Works is doing and leading uh, in a lot of these initiatives. So it's, it's always great to hear that and to know obviously that Illinois, um, uh, plays an important role in the workforce development landscape out there. Awesome. Thank so, you so much, sorry. Norman. Certainly. I appreciate, again, the conversation and uh, um, and uh, any any time in the future, if uh, there, there's more dialogue or conversation needed, we will certainly uh, uh, appreciate uh, come back and discuss with you. Great. Any final comments from you, Anna or uh, Monica? No, thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We appreciate it. We hope you found this webinar helpful and informational. Um, again, the recording will be posted and the follow-up survey is in the chat for all of you. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.